Welcome into On Texas Football Sunday Night Live Stream brought to you by our friend Joe Brown, the veteran mortgage broker over at Southside Bank. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Joe in a second. Uh, but Bert, first, a little bit of breaking news and not the good kind, Rod and CJ. Tavondre Sweat, defensive lineman, the University of Texas product, uh, apparently arrested for uh, DWI uh, earlier today in Austin. Uh, we do not know the specifics at this time. However, it's not a good look for a young man that's uh, hoping to go in the first couple of rounds uh, of the NFL draft, just uh, 20, uh, what, 14 days away, 17 days away, I guess is the best mm -hmm. way to put it. Uh, he pretty much kissed the first round goodbye. Not that he was going to end up there anyways, but this is one of those situations where it's tough uh, because you're literally, every little bit can help. And this certainly doesn't help. Uh, I, I saw Tavondre just a couple of weeks ago at a Texas practice. Happy-go-lucky, good young guy. Uh, bad situation today, though. He, he gets arrested in Austin uh, for the DWI. Uh, other news going on uh, today and across the weekend. Uh, Longhorns had, what, two dozen uh, guys in for uh, unofficial visit, CJ? That sounded about right. A lot of four and five stars across the board. The Longhorns picked up a commitment from a young man named Ricky Stewart. He's a running back out of Tyler Chapel Hill. Uh, he has helped them go deep in the playoffs a couple different years. Uh, played a lot injured last year and still rushed for more than 2,000 yards. Uh, Well-respected in his district. Uh, CJ, I'll let you start a little bit because you've seen him play uh, a little bit before. Rod, I'm going to let you watch film and then ask you about him. Uh, CJ, what did the Longhorns get here in Ricky Stewart? Yeah, a guy with a tremendous vision and one cut ability as a runner. Uh, you see it time and time again on kind of the outside zones and in that Chapel Hill offensive scheme. Uh, he'll just plant his outside foot in the ground, get up field, and uh, he's not a blazing fast guy, but he does have that breakaway speed that you see uh, allow him to make these kind of 30 and 40 yard runs in the 70 and 80 uh, that eventually get him into the house. But really good runner has a ton of production. Already, I think he rushed for close to 3,000 yards a year ago uh, in his college or high school career already. He's he's put up a big time numbers. Uh, as you can see, all of these runs are, <laughs> I mean, from the opposite side of the 50 yard line, and he's just housing them. So, a, a really impressive running back. And he's a great kid. He's a guy that uh, after he got the Texas visit January 20th, you, you, you could tell talking to him, the University of Texas and that offer from Steve Sarkeesian to Shard Choice meant a lot to him. He called it his dream school. And I know a lot of folks hear that and kind of, you know, kind of squimmer a little bit about, you know, kind of some prior recruitments and hearing that as well. But he's a guy that loves the University of Texas. He loves this university. And yesterday talking to him after his commitment, you can tell it felt like a big weight was lifted off of his shoulders. Great kid, great running back, great talent. And uh, Texas got themselves a good one here. Uh, Rod, your first time watching uh, Ricky here probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you see uh, out of the young running back from Tyler? Uh, yeah, I mean, Love is uh, his his first step there, right? He's got one cut ability, and you can tell once he is, makes his mind up, he's decisive. Uh, he's got the the speed, one to, kind of the speed, the acceleration. Uh, once he gets to the second level, to just really separate from the secondary, and you see it again there. I mean, over and over again, it seems like every highlight is the same with the young man. Um, it's weird. I mean, honestly, he kind of looks like Cedric Baxter to me a little bit. It's weird because <laughs> uh, he runs and number four. Yeah, yeah, number he four. Runs, he, runs, he runs high. He's yep. one of those guys where he, you know you don't really see him lower his pad level that much. And maybe it's just because I'm not seeing him uh, really just you know be in traffic a lot. Have to do that in terms of uh, you know uh, change of direction, um, having to take on uh, tacklers and break tackles. I mean, he seemed to be one of those guys that really just evades tackles really well. And his vision seems to be amazing. I mean, his vision seems to be two, three steps ahead of defenders here. Uh, when you see him, he, he's just not one of those guys that really gets into a convoluted situation after have to work through because his vision is so great. And he has that one cut ability. When he makes that cut, he accelerates right through the hole to any daylight. So, um, I mean, I, I, right. what I'm seeing right now is, I mean, he's one of those guys that will fit right into what Texas wants to do. Even Cedric Baxter said when he was in um, high school, he ran a lot of power schemes, a lot of gap schemes, came to Texas, and he had to learn how to be a zone runner as well as a power gap runner. And this is one of those guys seems like he's a natural zone runner. Like it's just, <laughs> uh, it comes natural to him. Um, so it's, that's one of those things I think that 
because because of the scheme that Texas runs. Uh, I don't know. If I'm not sure if they're looking at that specifically, but I do think that his game naturally translates. When I say even Cedric Baxter admits he had to learn on the next level. Yeah, I, hey, I Bobby, how about this? Is a yep. first down per carry good for you? Because that's what he averaged last it looks year. Like it. His yeah. junior year, he averaged 10.4 yards per carry, 40 touchdowns. So a guy that just finds the end zone. Well, I got to tell you this. There's, there's a couple things I want to mention here. Um, and the next piece of what I wanted to talk about from the overview today or, or tonight uh, actually was about the scrimmage. And all of us heard different things about the running backs from yesterday's scrimmage, whether that was Jaden Blue. I mean, his name popped up a couple of different times for people. Uh, uh, Trey Weiser's name got got brought up uh, as well. It sounds like Tashar Joyce is basically just on a roll right now. He's going to have what looks like – last year he had the top running back picked in the NFL draft. Actually, he had the top two, right, with uh, uh, not only Bijan but, but Jameer Gibbs, uh, who was his um, uh, uh, mentee, I guess, at Georgia Tech before going to Alabama. And then now you're going to have Jonathan Brooks. Looks like he could be RB1 off the board. And there's just several guys lining up right now uh, to end up uh, being Longhorns as well as what they're doing on the field. I, I wanted to mention both of those guys uh, going on and, and what's what's happening uh, with the Longhorns as it relates to the scrimmage. CJ, Rod, what, what else did y'all hear quickly about the scrimmage yesterday? Yeah, Jaden Blue was a big one that we continued to hear having talked to recruits, coaches, family members on campus yesterday. A name that we heard almost more so than anybody else was uh, <laughs> freshman wide receiver Ryan Wingo. And it was coming from people all over the place. You know, we heard it from Aiden Anding, uh, the cornerback out of Ruston, Louisiana, to Corian Moore, Jamie French, Kalik Lockett. They all had, you know, great things to say about the Texas wide receivers, specifically uh, uh, Ryan Wingo. So really impressive stuff there. Uh, Texas did a very good job offensively in the red zone. And that was a, a recurring theme that I heard from a number of sources. So I, I was, in, you know, impressed by that. I was a little bit, uh, you know, I think most people are a little worried or maybe on the fence about what they could expect about that red zone moving it moving forward. But uh, the first scrimmage of the of the spring session certainly, you know, yielded some some high remarks in the sense that Texas was converting and scoring in the red zone. Uh, also, one note of injury that we needed to, uh, to talk about just a little bit, DJ Campbell did not finish the practice at right guard. That was uh, Nato Umio Zulu who stepped in for Nato. Nato was seen uh, with a, an ice patch or ice pack. You mean, wait, wait, you mean, you mean DJ? DJ yeah, was seen with an ice pack. Yeah. DJ, DJ left practice and, and was seen with an ice pack on his, one of his shoulders uh, coming off the field at practice. So uh, a bit something to watch moving forward. But Texas, again, I, we were told that the offensive line continued to have success with NATO at right guard and Hayden Connor at left. Got yeah. it. I heard some good things, though, about uh, David Benda stepping up uh, in the scrimmage and making some plays. I'll say we've been, you know, talking about who's going to win that job, right? Op opposite Anthony Hill at that off-ball linebacker. I think you need three guys because I think depending on what you want to do with Anthony Hill, you might want to have another linebacker in there too. But it seems like David Dunda is going to be as the only sixth-year senior right on the roster right now. He's the OG. Uh, seems like the coaches trust him. He knows the scheme. And he may be one of those guys that's ready in his, you know, veteran with his veteran experience in his sixth year as a senior to really stabilize that position. Anthony Hill is going to be the star of the position, but you need somebody to stabilize it if they want to move him around, have him be a movable chess piece. Uh, looks like David Bender might be that guy. At least he's giving them a lot of confidence that he could be the one to stabilize it. And also I'll give some, I, I heard good things about a guy like Baron Sorrell stepping up and making some plays. He's another guy that's, and what I love about David Bender and Baron Sorrell, their stories, these are guys, kind of reminds me of Christian Jones too, right? They're going to be the guys who are breakout stars. They're going to be stars from the beginning, like uh, Xavier Worthy. He was a star from the time he stepped on campus. There'll be guys, you know, that that ultimately are those, I think, your kind of foundational pieces. But then there are guys who every year they just get better and improve, right? Whether it be transforming their bodies or adding a little bit to their game and kind of transforming themselves into a guy that can play on Sundays. Christian Jones is that. We first, everybody saw Christian Jones play first and was like, yeah, uh, I don't know if that guy's going to end up. I don't know if he's going to actually end up as a starter at the end of his career, let alone an NFL player. And now look at him because he got better every year, right? Got better, worked on every weakness in this game and really turned himself into a guy that potentially has a Sunday skill set. 
I think Baron Sorrell represents a, a guy like that. Uh, you know, I mean, when you start looking at date, and I'm not saying David Mims is an NFL guy. I don't know that. But in terms of it's improvement to be a guy that can win a starting job in your sixth season at, at Texas, uh, that's tough to do. Usually you're recruited over at that point. Usually at that time, the coaches have another plan, especially when there's a regime, a regime change and coaches want to bring in their types of guys. Uh, for him to be right now kind of the leader in the clubhouse at that position, I, I, I think it had, shows you a lot about his, his football character. I think that's what the coaches like about him. You're talking about ultimate program guys, too. Yeah. Um, you know, David Bender does not – you would not think he has a, a few NFL future. He did not exactly. start his first five years at Texas, really. Yeah. He started some games last year, but he was not a quote-unquote starter. Uh, you know, so he may be a little bit behind a Baron Sorrell, for example, who has started, or yes. Chris Jones was started, but neither of them came in with that blue-chip tag. They are ultimate development guys from yeah. a program, and so yeah. I I agree with you, Rod. I, I I think that that's a that those are the kind of guys that, that are the glue, right? That that a, a, that a team can they can count on them, right? Mm -hmm. At the yeah. times that the, you most need them. All right, the, got another thing I want to show you all, but before I do that, this is on Ricky Stewart, Rod. I want you to see this if you haven't seen it already. But before we go there, I want to say special thanks to our sponsor, Joe Brown, your veteran mortgage professor professional. Uh, Joe's a double graduate from the University of Texas, also a Navy veteran. He's been doing uh, mortgages in and around the Austin area and across the state of Texas for more than 30 years. In fact, he wrote my first mortgage, Rod Babers. So take that. <laughs> you know, that is now paid off. I've said that a couple of times on here. It's now paid off. So I'm excited about that. Uh, long story short, Joe's a good guy. I trust him uh, and he will take care of your business or your, your home purchase. He's one of the you know, this is one of the largest purchases you're ever making in your life. You want to be able to trust somebody. Uh, Joe Brown is one of those guys. Give him a call. 512-663-4744. If you're looking for a mortgage, that's 512-663-4744. All right, Rod, the next thing I want to show you is this. It's a commitment uh, from, uh, from our friend Ricky Stewart. Uh, and he actually committed to Jerry Hamilton yesterday on the video, uh, Matt, you're our <laughs> producer. Can you pull that up for us? Wow. Is that ready to go? Here it is. Watch this, guys. All right, on Texas football, here with Ricky Stewart, Chapel Hill running back. You got a little news today. Uh, yeah, I committed today during, during a practice. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a great year. Yeah. <laughs> what, what does it feel like to be a Texas Longhorn? Uh, very special, man. Perfect, special place. My my dream school, really. Uh, school, school. I always wanted to go to for the longest. Hey, mom. Hey, hey, mama knows. Mama knows. Rod, of all the people in the world, of, hey. on this chat right now, at least you know that feeling. Hey, you, you, you've hey. been through it, done it, and had that big old wide smile that you couldn't stop. Parents hey. had the same thing. What What'd you think about that? No, I can say mama knows. Uh, mama told me I was going to Texas. I hadn't even narrowed down my choice to, to Texas and AM yet. I still had five school moms like, No, nah, you're going to Texas. We're going to Texas, baby. And I was like, No, nah, mom. And what that's that she, you know, she had met Mac Brown, she talked to Mac. She had already made her mind up because she loved Mac Brown so much. And I tell you to your mama, she's probably feeling a certain way about Steve Sarkeesian, which is why she's so happy that her son is going to Texas. And that was his dream school. Now, Texas wasn't my dream school. That was the beauty of it. Like, Texas actually wasn't my dream school. Texas, just like now, has started trending, started being in its school again. Uh, it has started being Mac Brown had just gotten there. And then you know, Ricky Williams won the Heisman. So Texas was cool again. And the cool factor mattered. Uh, Texas is definitely cool again. And I also say this about Jerry. I, I always give credit to Jerry Hamilton. It's crazy that it works full circle that now I work with Jerry. And he's, uh, you know, obviously a good friend of mine now, but also a co-worker. Jerry Hamilton was the first one to give Rod B any type of love on any recruiting rankings or any recruiting nuggets. It was my man Jerry Hamilton it was out there hanging out. We was we, we was just trying to get a, a little pickup game with seven on seven with the North Shore boys out there who was loaded. It was me and my boy Jerome Sapp and Teron Woolery. And he was trying to get some work in. And hey, young Jerry Hamilton out there grinding, grinding, just trying to hey, just trying to find out who's gonna be the next one. 
And I'll, I'll give a shout out to Jerry Hamilton. He's the first one that gave Rod V some props. And after that, kind of took off. So I, I got to say this. What I liked most about it, that video, was the smile. Uh, those are the yeah. undeniable moments that you go through recruiting process. And now I, I want to bring someone else in. We've, we've been talking about running backs at the University of Texas. We have one that is uh, also committed to the University of Texas. Up next is going to join us on the show, and that's Racine Guillory. Racine, how you doing today, bud? I'm good. I'm good. good. <laughs> so you were there at the, at the scrimmage yesterday, back in town. You'd already committed to Texas, had come in on the January 20th weekend as well, back uh, this past weekend. How, how was it to see the Longhorns uh, in, in, uh, in person practicing? And congratulations, Racine, on your uh, your commitment to the University of Texas. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, getting back to the, to the campus, it was great. You know, I got to see what was going on inside instead of just looking on the outside. You know, I got to see what's going on with Coach Choice and his um coaching room, how he go with things. It was just a great experience just to see where I'm gonna be at after two years. Got it. We, we talked a little bit yesterday. Sorry, sorry, Bobby. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday, Racine, about your relationship with Coach Choice. While you're on the topic of them, I, I wanted you to kind of reiterate that to to, to Bobby and Rod and the, and the viewers today. It sounds like y'all have a pretty special bond. Yeah, our bond is real special. I mean, uh, just Coach Choice, a real guy. You know, talk to him about anything. If I want to talk to my my family, I can call him because he just like family. He gonna tell me the real. If I'm in the wrong, he's going to tell me I'm in the wrong. He's just a great guy. So that relationship is something that can't be broken no matter what happens. Nice. Hey, Racine, describe – we're going to have – Matt's going to play a little bit of your video behind this so people can watch him, uh, okay. watch you as well. But try to describe how you like to run and your running style uh, as it relates to, you know, what you what you think you do well, what you think you need to work on. That sort of stuff. After all, you're only going to be a junior in high school, yet you've mm -hmm. already, I mean, I mean, you're running, what, 10 yards, eight, nine yards of carry right now? Tell, yes, tell people about who you are as a runner. Um, I would say I'm a back that I want the big play. Like, the the five, ten yards, don't, it don't move me. You know, I need the long touchdown, make the crowd go crazy. I want to I want to be a, a entertainer, you know, make the crowd get on their feet. And I say <laughs> I'm a real electric player, and I – um. I feed off the stands energy. So if it's down, I'm going to be the person to make it get up, you know. I just say I'm a strong runner, um, vision there, you know, speed. Uh, I just – and then I got a, I, I got this thing that, like, my dad always told me, never let one man tackle you. So hmm. if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, I am I know I'm going to win every time. So I just do – I come in the game with that mindset, don't let one man tackle you. And that mindset just carry on all through – my whole football career and having that just it's kind of great it's kind of crazy racine you uh you play for a program that has won i think more state titles <laughs> excuse me than any other program in the in the in the state of texas yes, uh, sir. During its career. what's it like playing for alito a lot of people you know want to hear about that kind of stuff too because uh you're obviously they're also texas high school football fans what, what's it like playing for a program like alito Alito playing with Alito is like a full time job. It's like you you basically you basically in college, you know. Um, Mondays like we work we working out early in the morning and after school, so you really you know you gotta your time is really crunched. Like when you get home, you can't get on the game. You can't hang out after school. You gotta go home, do your homework, go to get go to sleep, and get ready for school again. It's like Really, the weekend is the only time you got to be a kid, and Monday through Friday you got to be on your ground, ready to work. You know, oh, with that being, we won. Like after we won our state championship, you know, a, I say a week went by. We turned in our pads and everything, and after that, it's back to work already. We already <laughs> back to lifting weights. <laughs> hey, no, days off, no days Rod, off, man. No days off. No days off at all. Rod, you've got the next question here, but I got to tell you this, Rod. He's got a teammate. Who happens to be Jermichael Finley's son, by the way? Up hey, in the week. I'm not sure if you knew I, that. I actually got a chance to meet that young man actually at a uh, camp that I was a coach at, and uh, yeah, he's got some he's got some skills, he's got some talent. I like that. Um, yes. Hey, Racy, I want to ask you this because I always ask this about running backs. Give me the play that that gets you giddy when you when you hear it in the huddle. 
What's that? Now you ain't got to give me the exact play. Don't give me the okay. exact. Play. I don't want I don't give me no secrets. But give me the type of play that you like. Oh yeah, man, this is it. I like this. This is money for me. Okay, so I got two plays. All right. And I know this might sound crazy, but the <laughs> first, the first play that like it give me like give me up is <laughs> when I go out for a wheel route. That's my favorite. Oh, yeah. That's my favorite thing because I get to go against them linebackers and I just burn them down the sideline. Like that's my favorite. <laughs> that's my favorite thing to do. So, and on a run play, I'll probably say I like inside, like an inside zone play. You know, no. most people most people think I'm a stretch type of guy, but I like the inside zone. You know, I like to make all the defenders bite down. As soon as they yeah. bite down, I'm bouncing outside. It's just. Yeah, inside it make it look more cooler, you know. A stretch play that's easy. You just hit the oh. hit the sideline, you gone. You know, I I want to make it, I want to make it look cool. Nice. Yeah. Hey, Racine, uh, you were at the scrimmage yesterday. We don't want to ask you too much because uh, don't want to, you know, violate any trust you have there with the with the team and the coaches, etc. But uh, how did the team look yesterday to you? What were some of the things that stood out? Oh, uh, they look great. I mean, defense did that thing today. You know. Uh, I talked to a lot of people. They say offense was offense was handling them for the past few days. So, you know, <laughs> defense defense got their lit back when I was there. But um, I say what impressed me was just how everything go. Like everything is quick, you know, and just how everybody it got energy at practice. Like it's like they in the game almost. And um, Jaden Blue impressed me a lot because you know they say I'm a. Most people say they try to compare my game to his. So when um when Coach Choice had talked to me and really told me how he was going to use me and it was more like a Jaden Blue type of guy. So just watching him, I mean, seeing him, what he do, how he carry himself, just being watching him, it really just, um I say, gave me some type of, like, motivation, you know. Well, I was going to say, watching you on your the film that uh, Matt, our producer, put up while you, while you were there, you had a lot of catches. Yeah. Like, you were catching the ball in the backfield. That's very Jaden Blueish, yeah. <laughs> if I if I don't say so. I mean, I I think that's great stuff. Uh, CJ Rod, y'all have a final question here before we let Racine go. It is after all a school night, guys. Don't <laughs> I got one last 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 question for you, Racine. It's yes, it's one that I like asking. You know, a lot of these you know big time prospects when you know you see the athleticism and you see the talent on the field, it's very eye popping. And with you specifically with the speed, it stands out. Uh, I guess going back to your early days of playing uh, of, of football, when did you start to know you had a, a little bit of an extra gear, you know, you had a leg up on some of the talent you were playing? So when I was like, um, I say like when I played like I played football for a long time. So when I was on like when I first started tackling, I did not want to play offense like I hated offense and because I, I was I was so slow and everybody used to tackle me all the time. So. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do this. And my dad was like, well, just go play defense, play linebacker. So I started playing linebacker and, you know, I was doing my thing. And then I fell in love with running the ball again because I see the love that people get when they run the ball. And mm -hmm. I want that. And so when I saw um my friend named Hayden West, he played running back and he went down one year. And so I had to step up into that role and I trained the whole summer ready for the season. So after I trained and that that season, I just started like I realized I was I got faster. I was scoring more touchdowns, you know. People making articles about me and all kind of stuff. So that's I say like AU AU year. That's when I knew I just had that. I had it to me. Like I, I had a whole different swag towards the game, you know. Yeah. All right, Racy. Thank you so much for your time, buddy. We appreciate you. And congratulations on your commitment. Hook them, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, Hook them. All right, yes, you sir. have a good one, man. Have a good uh, night. Have a good day Thanks, tomorrow. Racine. Thanks, Racine. Uh, uh, I want to say thank you again to our sponsor. That's Joe Brown. He sponsors the Sunday Night Live stream. Give him a call, 512-663-4744. If you're looking for a mortgage, that's 512-663-4744. also want to say thank you to the folks over at Flat Creek Estate. They're also one of our uh, sponsors uh, nowadays. Uh, that is the winery. Uh, that frankly is winning awards going out of style. 11 in 30 days uh, they won, including the double gold Grand Reserve and Texas Grand Reserve recently at the Houston Rodeo. Uh, Flat Creek Estate Winery is raking them in. 
and it's just a few minutes down from downtown Austin. Uh, select bottles of by Splat Creek Estate are now available at your local specs, and you can get a taste of what they're all about there. Flat Creek Estate is also a gorgeous venue, hosting events for the whole family all spring, like tomorrow. And that's one of the reasons I'm reading this forum tonight. You can actually go out and they're having an event for the eclipse. So check it out. Flat Creek Winery, uh, our friends over there. Eat, drink, and be awesome at flatcreekestate.com. Thank you uh, for your sponsorship as well. All right, guys, uh, we got to get back in this and talk a little bit uh, more about some other stuff. This uh, We got some questions brewing on the... Uh, in the chat, I want to rotate back to the negative news of the day uh, because we need a, it, you know, it, it started off and we only gave it about a minute or two worth of our attention. Uh, Rod, CJ, what do y'all think about the Tavondre Sweat and his uh, poor decision making, I guess, uh, two weeks before the NFL draft? Um, I'll start, uh, Dane Brugler, I'll just start with the Dane Brugler tweet that I saw, which was interesting because I think he's coming at it from a NFL scouting perspective. He said, according to a team source, Sweat has been upfront with NFL teams about his quote unquote partying as an underclassman and made it a point of emphasis in interviews that it was all in the past. Um, this incident obviously will bring that back to the forefront. NFL teams, they do put that in your scouting reports, right? What you like to do off the field if you have a reputation for someone who likes to party, who likes to get down, that kind of stuff. Um, and I guess NFL scouts thought that, you know, Tafondre Sweat had a reputation uh, for a guy that liked to party on, the, on his time off. And that this does not help that situation. So from a scouting perspective, that was something they, they probably always was, was a red flag or a negative data point against him. And now it's going to come up again. So, yeah, it'll probably drop his stock. And there are some NFL teams loving that, by the way, unfortunately, because they're thinking, hey, man, we're going to get a bargain. This guy is going to drop to the middle of the late second rounds. Unfortunately, that's just how. NFL draft works. Uh, details, though, I will say there are several uh, Austin news stations reporting on it. Um, my man Corey Mose does a great job at KVU. Uh, he says it was at 2.12 p.m. A lot of people saying it was in the a.m. Is in p.m. is what they're saying here. Um, if that's the case, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sure that maybe there's a, there's a reason for it. If you're going to be drinking during the day, just having a good time, Sunday fun day or whatever, probably should just get an Uber. Or hey, he's big time enough. You could have a driver. So for him, that's a decision making thing. It's like that's not worth that's not worth the value you're gonna lose in the draft and the money you're gonna lose. So that's a lesson for him. That's all that is. Uh, it said he was arrested on I-35 in North Austin. So I think that you won't detail. That's that comes from uh, Corey Mose, my man Corey Mose. Um, and it also, like I said, it says DWI. So and that that means it was driving while intoxicated. My thing was at, at two twelve p.m. I'm assuming he was brunching or something like that and probably was just, you know, driving from one place to another and ended up, you know, obviously getting stopped by the police. So it's unfortunate. It's not, you know, like I said, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's not something for him um, that I think ultimately will drop him too far out of the, uh, outside of the second round. I think he'll still be a second round pick. And so some teams will drop him a little bit lower on their board, unfortunately, but it's a lesson for him. You got to learn that, man. You can't be with what you have at stake now. And what, listen, nobody should be driving while intoxicated. If you, if you want to drink, that's fine. Now there are options that you have, especially with ride sharing. So nobody should be doing that, especially someone with as much to lose as to Vondre Sweat. So. Yeah, I gotta say this. You, I, I just think of you talking about brunch. I'm like thinking, how many mimosas would it take? <laughs> I mean, he's a fairly large person, you know. BJ, what what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's very unfortunate, especially the month leading up to what will be one of the biggest moments of your entire life with the NFL draft. Uh, that that's you know really unfortunate. There was a, a number of Texas guys, uh, you know, Jordan Winnington, Jalen Ford, T. Sweat, all on campus this weekend uh, to watch the first scrimmage. Uh, he was at the softball game Saturday night, so uh, you know he loves being around this area. Obviously, had a, a lot of connections to the school still. Uh, having just, you know, basically departed about three or four months ago. So really unfortunate that it happens on a weekend where I think a lot of folks were celebrating Texas football, Texas softball, the big series win, yeah. uh, you know, and I was getting ready to say that this is a look at this. You talk. Let's talk. Let, let's talk about this. Todd Lacey puts this up. Give it a read, CJ, and let everybody know what happened today. 
Yeah, big win for Texas softball uh, and Coach White coming in and, and knocking off number one Oklahoma, winning the series two games to one out of the three game series at the McCombs Field uh, up here in Austin. Uh, hey, first conference series loss for Oklahoma since 2011. How about that? That's wow, uh, the, quite a run that they've had on the diamond there, uh, and a back to back two to one victories. Uh, for the Lady Longhorns, really impressive stuff from a defensive and a pitching side, uh, but also making sure that, you know, you get over the top and find some runs when you need some big home run uh, late in the game to, uh, again, seal that victory against Oklahoma. Uh, I mean, you're looking at a pretty, pretty uh, special squad right now, Bobby. Pretty, pretty good season so far. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm happy for him. Anytime OU has had a stranglehold on softball for so long, hmm, uh, yeah. they, they actually, I, they, Women's softball actually revolves around Oklahoma City, too, by the way. They have the mm-hmm. brickyard there where they, they literally have every major tournament in the country is played out of there. So uh, big stuff uh, for Mike White and uh, the uh, Longhorns uh, to win two of three from Oklahoma. All right, uh, we're going to spend the rest of the, this after or this evening, excuse me, uh, taking questions uh, on the live chat. So please feel free to get your questions in. We'll get to them as quickly as possible. CJ, I'm going to leave this one for you. Uh, Jason Washington wants to know, how did the early enrollees do yesterday? Uh, You talked to a lot of people that were at the event. I talked to a couple. Ryan Wingo's name continues to get mentioned among the early enrollees, not just from Steve Sarkeesian's mouth anymore, by the way, either. Yeah, Ryan Wingo was probably the name we heard the most often yesterday. Just, I, I would say, surprising folks, which... You know, you don't hear a five-star doing that too often. You know what kind of talent they have uh, coming in. But to hear that from, you know, DeCorian Moore, Jamie French, Kalik Lockett, it really goes to show that, you know, they keep an eye on what kind of talent Texas has on roster, good and bad. And I think all of them came away very surprised and, you know, kind of giddy about what talent was on the roster for the Longhorns and what kind of talent, you know, Ryan Wingo is specifically. Uh, We heard some good things about Christian Clark as well, kind of the the – the power, the shiftiness that he brings as a runner. Uh, Xavier Phil Samia heard a shout out from him. Uh, Zane Rowe, the 2027 Denton Geyer athlete, told us that uh, Colin Simmons had a pair of sacks as well. So a, a lot of intriguing notes on the, the early enrollees. Uh, talked to an uh, offensive line prospect on campus yesterday as well who was watching Brandon Baker. Said that he loves the way that he uses his feet and able to move in his pass set. So uh, a lot of guys – looking at the position very closely, especially with these early enrollees and kind of getting a lay of the land from a depth chart perspective, while also looking at the Texas roster as a whole and seeing what kind of talent that they have on the field. All in all, I would say a very positive takeaway from the recruits, the family members, the coaches that we talked to yesterday, uh, early enrollees specifically, Ryan Wingo, again, big winner from Texas's first scrimmage of the spring session. Have you heard anything, CJ, of the young defensive backs? Because there's so many. I mean, not only Wardell Mack, Xavier feels to me. Uh, I'm trying to think. Kobe Black, mm-hmm. Jordan Johnson, Rubel, uh, Santana Wilson, not on campus yet. And you hearing anything? Any of those guys uh, starting to crack the two deep at, at this point, or is it still one of those things where uh, it's wait and see? Yeah, it's early. Uh, Kobe Black's been getting a little bit of run with the second unit. I've heard. Uh, also, it, it it dates back about a week ago when Malik Muhammad was sidelined a little bit. Kobe was that first freshman in the defensive back to bump up to that second unit. Uh, it's interesting, Bobby. I've heard a lot of uh, a lot more about contested catches from this wide receiving group, which is one a positive in the sense that you know the hands are there. Uh, you're making tight you know, receptions in traffic, but two, that DBs are making a play on the football. And Rod, we've talked about this in the past. It's not always been the case for the Texas Longhorns in the secondary uh, to be swiping at the football when it's in the air or in the vicinity of a wide receiver. Uh, You're there to make the play, make sure that you get the guy on the ground. But now we're starting to hear more and more about DBs fighting through the hands of wide receivers. And it's starting young. I think Wardell Mack does a tremendous job of that. And you go back to his high school take, uh, uh, out of uh, Arizona, and or, sorry, Wardell Mack, you really just get an idea of what kind of talent he is whenever he swipes up the football. He gets it. He has that mindset that that ball needs to get on the ground, and uh, he's a guy that I've heard you know a, a, a bit about so far this spring as well. Good stuff. Uh, hey, I, I want to bring up uh, the good and the bad here. It's only fair. Um, and Longhorn had something here that I want to ma- mention. Uh, it says not accurate. I think he's talking about uh, 
our conversation about NATO going in at right right guard. The red zone had Cole Hudson, not Neto. Uh, the only right guard Neto had was when the injury first happened and Cole had just gone across scrimmage. Obviously, this person may have been at the scrimmage, so I want to uh, mention this. Red zone was only 54, which is Cole, Cole Hudson. Please do it right. I, I can't. We can't debate because we're not allowed to see scrimmage, to be clear, uh, unless it's under a media window. And so all we're doing is passing on what we heard. So that's uh, that's one of the things that uh, happened there. All right, uh, let's go to Justin Yarbrough, guys. Bobby and CJ, sounds like recruiting is really starting to heat up. Where do you all see the recruiting class before the high school season starts? Thanks for the uh, super chat, Justin. Longhorns with Ricky Stewart now have five commitments on the recruiting campaign. I think the big takeaway, CJ and, and Rod, that I had from this weekend whether it was DeCorian Moore or Jamie French or any of any of these guys, really, is I don't know that a single player left Austin without Texas having a legitimate chance to land them. Yep. You, you agree with that? I mean, these were – and these are the elite of the elite that they want, Rod and CJ. CJ, you were there interviewing them. Would you agree with that supposition? Yeah, absolutely. And having talked to a number of guys, I think Texas made big moves this weekend in, in terms of where their position was. Uh, uh, I would look at this visitor list from this uh, this past Saturday and say, yeah, this was probably, if not the very, very top, amongst the top of the Texas board at each position. You know, they were very specific with who was on campus this weekend. Only one linebacker, Elijah Barnes, no tight ends. They're coming in this week. Uh, but your wide receivers, DeCorey Moore, Jamie French, Kalik Lockett, I mean, those guys, Kelshawn Johnson even, those are your four top targets at the wide receiving spot at the moment. Uh, and Texas able to get them on campus with a number of big-time offensive linemen, the Coleman Twins, John Mills, Tyler Thomas, as well as your quarterback in the class, K.J. Lacey, kind of being able to – uh, kind of build that camaraderie amongst one another and use KJ Lacey as a recruiter on the team in that class already. Uh, I really think Texas is using this past weekend as kind of a basis to say, all right, we know who we want. Now let's get them an opportunity to get on campus, see the team in person and spend time with them. Uh, it's worth mentioning again, to Corey and more uh, Jamie French, Elijah Barnes spent the night in Austin, uh, Saturday evening. We're back up on campus again this morning to spend extra time with Steve Sarkeesian and the staff. Uh, those poor guys never get uh, days off if you're a, a college uh, head coach and assistant coach. But uh, if you're able to recruit a DeCorey Moore and a Elijah Barnes and get them on campus, it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. But that's kind of been the recurring theme, Bobby, is you saw a lot of the top targets on the Texas board. They came into Texas, they saw the scrimmage, and they came away with great reviews. I, I want to mention one other offensive lineman that was there, and that's Lamont Rogers, by the way, too. A uh, young man uh, from uh, the uh, Dallas area. His mom, I'm told, met with one of the deans at the business school. She was all about the academics. So uh, it takes all kinds right there. All right, Rod, this one, I got to give you this one, buddy. When they when they write the super chat, we, we absolutely <laughs> read it. Is it me or does Rod sound like Kevin Hart? I'm sorry. <laughs> Carry on. Hook him. Jonathan, you know, uh, Rod, Rod's a good sport. He can take that. I've gotten that before. This is not the first time I've gotten the Kevin Hart uh, comparison. I do, I do sports radio. So trust me, I've got people say, I mean, why is Kevin Hart talking about the Longhorns? Why is Kevin Hart criticizing the Cowboys? <laughs> yes, I do sound like Kevin Hart. And I've also gotten, since we're so close to San Antonio, that I sound a bit like Avery Johnson at times. Yeah. Jack Avery, a me and Avery Johnson also sound very similar. So yeah, I've got no. Hey, you you're, tall, you're you're taller than Kevin Hart. Uh, right? yeah, not by, much, not, by, not, not by much. Apparently, yeah, apparently not by much. If you look at the combat, <laughs> I think it was five eight three quarter. What is Kevin Hart? Five 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 six something like that. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> hey, this one's back. This is more for you, Rod. This is a guy that's uh, from your era a little bit. Uh, yeah. he's a little bit younger than you. Uh, from Longest Word, what do you think about a Ramonts Taylor comp for Rick, oh. Ricky Stewart? I thought I saw a little DJ oh. Monroe in there too. DJ yeah. was a little bit thinner and shorter. He was small, yeah, uh, he was a little Stewart. smaller. But but Ramonts Taylor's interesting. The Ram now I oh man that is Ramonts Taylor is such a damn good athlete. I remember a few years ago I hosted a Ramonts Taylor uh, celebrity uh, kickball game or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> And man, I, I witnessed this dude dunking, and it, like I said, he was 
I consider him an old man by then. He was still dunking, like on a basketball gym, dunking. Um, that dude was a freak of an athlete. So I don't know athletically, his athletic profile, like I said, I'm not going to dismiss the young man because he looks great on film. I don't know if his athletic profile is where Ramon Taylor was because athletically, man, he was just next level. Uh, I do see the the hot, the, the straight up running style. They have that very similar, that that one cut, once they, they're very decisive and once they make that cut, boom, the acceleration. I do see that as well. Um, I think that Ramon's might have been, I don't want to say shiftier, but may have been better at breaking tackles. But like I said, that's just in the highlight room. I got to go watch the young man play a game, uh, Ricky Stewart, and see like how often he breaks tackles. Uh, that's on the highlight video. They got him a, a lot of times just – uh, making great decisive cuts and then being able to evade and avoid defenders. So I see some of it. I see some of it. Um, but man, Ramonts, we hell, we didn't see much of Ramonts either when you think about it. I mean, we didn't, what did we get two years of Ramon Taylor pretty much? Well, I don't even know if we saw his game evolve to where it should have been because he should have been one of those guys that could have been a, you know, a basic guy that could hurt you as a receiver, uh, shifting and motion out as a guy that could put in the backfield. He should have been one of those movable chess pieces. I don't think we ever got to see it uh, totally materialize and come to fruition, though. All right, so this one's from Ryan Nelson. Uh, Jelani McDonald, quote, looks impressive, according to team sources. I, I can, I've I been out there for that and seen enough of him to say that there's no doubt. There's two guys on defense that are as impressive looking as anybody in the secondary, and that's Derek Williams and Jelani McDonald. Nice. Uh, Jelani's issue has not been his looks, it's been the speed of his play. Um, and he was still learning to play safety during uh, winter practice, and that's moved in. They've had now nine practices in spring ball. He's not necessarily going as fast as a Derek Williams, who's had a full year at the position. So even though he looks impressive, we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens and what that really looks like uh, when – uh, we see him in, 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 in the spring game, I hope, uh, here in a couple of weeks. All right, a uh, couple other questions I want to get to. Again, uh, this is the Sunday Night Live stream. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers and C.J. C. Vogel. Uh, this is brought to you by Joe Brown. Uh, Joe's a good friend of ours, uh, veteran mortgage professional at Southside Bank. Uh, give Joe a call, 512-663-4744. That's 512-663-4744. He's done a lot of people's mortgages through the years, 30 plus years. He's done numerous Texas athletes. He's got two degrees from Texas, as well as spent a stint in the Navy. Uh, Joe Brown, 512-663-4744. You want to be able to trust somebody when they do your mortgage. He's been doing it a long, long time. Uh, we appreciate his sponsorship uh, of on Texas football. All right, let's go a little further here and talk a little bit more, uh, guys, about some of the things. Uh, I'm going to ask you this one. Uh, CJ, based on spring performance so far, who are the top three receivers and tight end? Thanks for your question, Kelly. It horns up. Yeah, it's it's interesting. After all the buzz and all the noise, it's hard not to throw Ryan Wingo into that group after what we've heard this weekend. And obviously wow. from Sarkeesian, Quinn Ewers, uh, some of the guys that we've met with in uh, player availabilities uh, over the last week or two. Uh, but right now, Isaiah Bond's in that top group. Uh, Jonte Cook's made some noise, and as has Matthew Golden, who I think we've all kind of been impressed with having watched him in person mm -hmm. at practice. That's kind of been a guy that I've uh, been pleasantly surprised with. We know that he was a talented prospect coming out of high school, made some big plays at Houston, uh, but I wasn't necessarily expecting what I've seen so far at practice when we're able to walk up and, and see the uh, practice uh, for, for the media availability. He's been really impressive to me so far. Uh, your tight end is Gunnar Helm, who – we heard from a couple recruits on campus this weekend. He tried to hurdle a pair of defenders today. I didn't know Gunnar Helm had that uh, in his bag. I don't. He wasn't successful, but uh, you know, to, to give it a go, that takes some stones to do that. If you're Gunnar Helm, he's gonna. Be I heard, heard Nye Black also had a. I heard Nye Black had a 30 yard TD reception from Arch Manning as well. Yes. Yes. So they're they're uh, they're they're doing whatever whatever they can. Hey, I want to uh, put some other stuff in here. Uh, and get going on, on a couple other questions. Rod, this one's going to be for you from Jarrett Johnson. Uh, what fundamental change would you like to see in the defense next year? They had a pretty good year in 2023 now. Mm. I mean, don't can't you can't poo-poo them too much. They had a pretty good year. What do you think? Yeah. Fundamental change. Well, it's got to come from the, the secondary and the back end, right? If you're talking about a fundamental change, I would like to see them play with 
better leverage overall and see them play more hard press man inside, inside press man, where they're taking away the inside cuts, which they did, by the way, later on in the year. Um, I'd like to see them do it more consistently. And when they do it, the big thing is, and they did it, like I said, the last three games of the year, they did it. Texas Tech, Oklahoma State in the Big 12 title game and against uh, Washington in the Sugar Bowl. Uh, but they gave up the deep ball, as you guys know, and saw so in that Oklahoma State game and the Washington game. So they were playing more of the, uh, the press man to take away the easy. And Sark talked about this, take away the easy completions, the quick game, and that helps out the pass rush. So the pass rush can get home because the quarterback can hold on to the ball just a half a second longer. And then you can have some guys like Colin Simmons get to the quarterback uh, but take away the easy completions, but then you got to safeguard yourself against the deep ball. So that's just technique. Um, I can see them get better at playing press man, but I can see them do it more, which I think they're going to do. Sark says they want to do it. They're going to do it. You do that along with adding what you did last year in the front seven and your rush defense and your situational defense, third down red zone defense, which were elite last year. You can, if you, I'm not, I don't know if you'll continue to be elite, but you can just stay in the top 20 top, you know, the top tier in those situational aspects of the game, I think the the DBs, if they start doing their part by being more aggressive on the outside, I think you'll start to see another leap by the defense next year, just like they took uh, last season. Good stuff. I hope so. Hey, I want to co uh, comment on this one. Uh, Jim Beard uh, said it well. It's impressive to hear these young men comport themselves in an impression, impressive fashion, racing, nicely done, and to hook them also be hurt. Ricky Stewart a little bit as well. Yeah, I think it just seems like good kids, right? I mean, I know yeah. you can you can't always tell anything by a five minute interview, a ten minute interview, uh, but they certainly uh, were respectful and uh, very very well spoken. Hey, uh, no, hey, no, what Bobby? It's not 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 necessarily that because you're right. You can't tell a ton by that, but because of what Sark has reiterated over and over and over again that the character is going to be the, one of the top priorities and top data points in their evaluation because they're all fast and they're all explosive and they're all really, really good players, but they got to have the right character that's compatible with our program. I do think Longhorn fans are now willing to accept that the guy commits like, all right, he, they've been vetted enough. And it kind of reminds me of Mac's years. Mac did that. I mean, Mac had his years where you can't, I mean, vet every young man perfectly. Everybody's going to make mistakes and make bad decisions. Uh, that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think that's why I think we trust the young people coming into the program now is that starts, you know, told us over and over again, no, 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 the character matters for us, man. It, it's a big deal. And if they, we don't see the signs of the good character and the compatibility with the culture, we ain't bringing them in no matter how damn talented they are. Trust that. I trust that. I trust it now. I, I think, it, well, here, here's the reality too. It's not, Sark is not anti um giving kids second chances he doesn't they don't have to be choir boys yeah to, to put put it right i think mac started airing on that side of things because he felt like he got burned by a couple guys he gave it second chances to That's robert fair. timmons for example yeah. you, you know what i mean very yeah, talented remember. player but you know just and so i think mac felt a little burn and kind of overcorrected a little bit yeah. sark hasn't overcorrected if that makes sense. I mean, I agree. you know, you're not, this is football. You're not looking to, to fill out the, you know, the tabernacle choir. So <laughs> my point being, there's a, there's, there's a, a limit there. Hey, CJ, I'm going to go to you for this next one because you and Bingle talked a little bit uh, about this uh, in a uh, uh, video earlier today is on Texas football, taking 2.5 Longhorns drafted in the Longhorn draft in the, in the first round of the draft. In other words, are we taking the over, that we think it'll be three, or do we think it's going to be two? Or, Rod, do you think it might be one? It's mm -hmm. all this uh, brouhaha about Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy going in the first uh, up there. We know, or at least I, I think, the most surefire first-round pick for the Longhorns is Byron Murphy at this point. Yep. What, what do yeah. you think, CJ? You, you take it from there. I'm taking the over, but just barely. And and Bengal and I had a great video uh, put up this this afternoon about the NFL draft and the Longhorns and kind of their hopes and, and predictions, mock draft, kind of whatever you want to call it, about where they might end up hearing their name called uh, in just over two weeks. I, again, Bobby, you mentioned it. Byron Murphy 
probably the most solidified Longhorn in that first group. You have to take care of the trenches in the NFL draft, and he's a guy that you can look at and say, yeah, he might be the best interior defensive lineman of anybody in this draft class. Uh, I think right now anywhere from the mid-teens to the early 20s is where you'll hear him. There's two spots for A.D. Mitchell that I'm looking at that really have some interesting uh, you know, intrigue for me. That'll be the Chargers at 23 and the Bills at 28. Both of them need wide receivers. Both of them have talent, talented quarterbacks. And A.D. Mitchell, with his size, speed, and, and hands, uh, feels like a perfect fit for either Justin Herbert or Josh Allen. The big question mark to me is Xavier Worthy. And I know he just ran a 4-2-1, and I know that he put a, a great day together at the Texas Pro Day in front of 90 scouts and three NFL head coaches. But he's kind of been that fringe first or second round guy since the season concluded. Was that draft day enough? Uh, or sorry, was that pro day enough? We'll see. I think right now the Chiefs needing a wide receiver as badly as they do, it makes all the sense in the world to go add the fastest guy the Combine's ever seen next to Patrick Mahomes and let him work uh, a, another year with a big-time speedy wide receiver. It worked out pretty well the first time that that happened. Uh, we'll see. But right now I think he does squeak into that back end of the first round. Hey, yeah. Rob, what do you think? Over and under? I'll go over. I go. I feel confident about the over too, because I look at it. You know, right now you're looking at six wide receivers, six to seven drafted in the first round, and that's why CJ is right. He's right on the money there, because I believe AD Mitchell, or Xavier Worthy, depending on the, the the wide receiver rankings, they're right there in that sweet spot. They're at five to seven in terms of the wide receiver rankings overall. But recently, Mel Kiper pushed me over the top because I heard Mel Kiper on an interview, and he said. He said he, he's going back to watch the film on all the wide receivers. And I've watched a lot of film on all of them, too. And it's a it's a really impressive group of wide receivers. I mean, I think you got some legit uh, wide receiver ones in this group. Um, there will be three taken in the top 12 picks or whatever. I mean, there's just no doubt. Mel Kuyper said that his fourth wide receiver now uh, is Xavier Worthy. He said he's got him just as good as any of those other guys outside the top three, which is, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr., um, Malik Neighbors and Romeo Dunze. He said outside that, he said he, he in the next tier, he said it's hard for him to rank another receiver ahead of Xavier Worthy, which would have basically have him fourth on uh, that list. Think about Xavier Worthy, he is an outlier. Like, most re receivers like Xavier Worthy fail at the NFL level. They do. If you're looking at history, they do. If they're as light as he is at 165 pounds, the only receiver that's really been that light and also been a thousand yard receivers to Sean Jackson and Devontae Smith. They're pretty much the only two that, that really you can point at that are that light that also end up being thousand yard. Now, more and more, those types of receivers are entering the NFL, but they're not being drafted in the first round. They're being drafted second round, third round, when Tank Dell was drafted, that kind of thing. So drafting them in the first round means you, you consider at, at the premium position that they're not going to be a negative outlier. They're going to be a positive outlier. You look at receivers that are extremely fast, like Xavier Worthy. The only if you look at the top 25 fastest receivers at the NFL combine, the history of it, Santana Moss is the only one that's been a thousand yard receiver. So there are a lot of things working against him recent history wise. But I believe, and I'm, I'm a little biased, that is true, that he is the positive outlier. I think he has really good play strength for a guy his size. He is, he is a, which is kind of the outlier of really fast guys. He is a really good football player that happens to have world class speed, as opposed to most of those guys who are just world-class speedsters who happen to play football. Mm -hmm. and I agree. Hey, Rod, I got to – let me ask you this, because this, this is a great question, because uh, Marquise Hollywood Brown, OU receiver, right? Mm -hmm. Not that dissimilar from, from uh, the profile of Xavier Worthy from the fact no. that uh, was extremely fast, a flyer, thin build. He hasn't really been all that much. I heard somebody compare Xavier Worthy to that, and my response was, Hollywood Brown was not the football player Xavier Worthy was. I don't think so. Not, not for a long period of time. I mean, Xavier was the guy. Hollywood Brown was a piece of what Oklahoma did, in my opinion. You you agree with that that kind of a yeah. nuance? No, I agree with you. And he's, uh, I mean, he's right. I think he got, he had 1,000 yard season in his, what, five years in the league. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think Xavier Worthy is a much better football player overall than Hollywood Brown. That's why, I, that's why I think he may be a positive outlier. But 
I will say the Kim Kardashian, Nicki Minaj, Serena Williams house, but here is the system that he goes to is going to be key. The system he goes to is, is what CJ is talking about. If he ends up in Kansas City, well, whoever the hell ends up in Kansas City is going to be, they're going to be, right? They're going to be on down a yellow brick road, right? They're going to be good. They'll be perfect. They'll be on the way to potential Hall of Fame career. Um, but if he ends up in the wrong system, who doesn't know how to utilize and weaponize him, then yeah, he could be Hollywood Brown. He could be Hollywood Brown or he could be what Devontae Smith is right now. I mean, he could be either one of those guys. I don't know. Or he could be someone who's better or worse than those guys. It really is depending on where he goes and where he ends up. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, uh, Tombstone. Thanks for the super chat. Edward Cosby asked us uh, if T Sweat's arrest for DUI or DWI will affect his draft status. We answered that earlier, but for those of you guys just tuning in, we believe it will. How much, though, is the question? How okay. much, though? Interesting, y'all both went to uh, the over on two and a half first rounders, though, uh, for the Longhorns. That the draft, by the way, April 25th, uh, just five days after, by the way, after uh, the Texas spring game. All right, let's yeah. go to uh, Freelance Society as a uh, super chat for us. How many reps do you think Quinn will get in a spring game? Hey, this is a good one because he's now in that different category, guys. He's now, yeah. uh, he may get, I don't know, three series. I was going to say two. I was gonna say, say two. two I was gonna say two. I mean, what do I need to see? I'm good. I don't need to see much from Quinn. I let me see the young bucks. Let me see Arch. Let me see Trey Owens. I don't I need to see two series. Hopefully they're really good series. But you said three, so we're close. Two or three. Two to three. Hey, I don't think it's ever a bad thing to get him live reps. I mean, as long as he's not getting hit, which he'll be in the black jersey. He won't be getting touched in that pocket. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see him out there. Let's let's see something new. Let him show something off, a new a, a new trick he's adopted in his bag this offseason. I'd like to see him out there for four. Okay. I want to see the day. Let him work. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Gotcha. Good stuff, guys. Hey, uh, thank you uh, from Freelance Society as well. Uh Here's a here's a question for us, Corey Peacock. Does it look bad on the Texas coaching staff to have so many players drafted compared to Washington? <laughs> Washington's gonna have what six or seven themselves plus their quarterback. I was gonna hey, say that they have the old no, line. They, the they're not they're not devoid of talent at Washington. Honestly, they're gonna have the, the, they're gonna have two wide receivers drafted at least, right? Maybe three. They're gonna have three, drafted, yeah, three first right rounders as well. Yeah, yeah they'll have three first rounders. Rounders. here here, here twice. Yeah, I wanted to mention this because it, it. I think the combine is more a gauge on how how much quality NFL talent you have. They had 13 invites to the combine this year. Texas had 12. So, I mean, they were on the same page, basically, of talent. Does it look bad for Texas? I mean, they were a play away from winning a game. Uh, 10 yards, 11 yards, whatever it was. I mean, it was a close game. Texas had the opportunities. Washington that night, I mean, it was just their day. So I, I don't think it's a bad look for Texas. You know, those teams are very evenly matched. What is the big outlier here is Michigan had 18 players invited to the combine. That's essentially 18 of your 22 yeah. starters, you know, basically on your offense and defensive side of the ball. That gives you an idea of just how talented they were from an NFL's perspective uh, for talent this past year. Clearly, it paid off with them winning uh, handedly the national championship. All right, so we've got time for a couple more questions. Before we do that, I want to say thanks one last time to Joe Brown, who presents our Sunday night live stream, uh, veteran mortgage banker, 512-663-4744, three decades of experience as a mortgage professional. Uh, he actually wrote my first mortgage loan twenty five more than 25 years ago. I looked at my wife when I read this uh, ad the other day, and she just shook her head at me like, I can't believe I've been married to you for that long. So uh, anyways, long story short, congratulations. And Joe's been a great, great guy all around uh, mortgage professional for a long period of time. If you're looking for a, a home and need a top rate mortgage guy that you can trust, give Joe a shout. He's been doing it for a long time. 512-663-4744. Also want to say thanks to the guys over at Flat Creek Estate Winery. Uh, if you're looking a place to go to and do the eclipse tomorrow, Give them, a, give them a chance. Uh, they've got a beautiful estate. You can see that here. Just absolutely gorgeous uh, vineyards, uh, as well as uh, community spaces, uh, food, et cetera. Uh, they're going to have a lot of people out there tomorrow. And it's I think it's 45 minutes to an hour outside downtown. Uh, that's Flat Creek Estate. They've been just killing it on the award circuit for wines, kind of like what Tito's was doing for vodka 
uh, when they first came out 20, 25 years ago as well. All right, a couple time for a couple more questions uh, here tonight. We're going to get to them right now. Um, let's start with uh, uh, let's start with this one from Chen Ups. Uh, any chance that a large human out of DeSoto, Byron Washington, could be a defensive tackle? I don't know. See, I'm going to let you answer that. But my understanding is he's committed to, to Syracuse, and Texas didn't really fight for him that heavily. Is that that the uh, understanding you had of that recruitment? Yeah, he visited last last summer in July. Texas didn't get him back on campus after that. Uh, the big kind of concern with Byron Washington is, hey, he's 6'8", 380. He's listed at. He's probably closer to 400 pounds. What makes your defensive tackle so special was the quickness a year ago. Byron Murphy, the strength there, his first step. Uh, Tavondre Sweat, we even saw it a number of times. His ability to get into the backfield was a strength of his at 360 pounds. I don't think you see that same athleticism, that get off and acceleration from a Byron Washington who's been his entire career playing football, been going backward rather than going forward uh, on a snap to snap basis. So that's a big jump. I don't think you're going to see that athleticism in his game unless he takes a big, big step forward in where his body is uh, down the road. Right now, I think offensive line is where you'll see him. And I don't think Texas at the moment is interested. I got to add this, David Keith Williams with a good comment, because we had that question about uh, comparing the uh, talent at Texas and Washington. Uh, David Keith Williams with a very true point. <laughs> Rod's, Rod's point at this one. I also think the two fumbles were significant in Huge. Washington beating Texas. They never uh, saw the ball. Remember, they missed a whole quarter of football. They didn't even have the ball basically for a whole quarter of football because of those two fumbles pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And, and they were moving at that one time, that last fumble as well from Jaden Blue. So, uh, you know, look, Texas had its chance in those game, in that game, particularly yeah. there at the end. Uh, hopefully uh, they uh, are better in the red zone uh, this year than they were a year ago. All right, uh, that's going to do it for tonight. Uh, just to wrap up, Texas softball wins the series two to one over. Uh, oh, oh, whoa, Rod B. Keep you on my diapers fund. Hey, there you go, Rod. That, baby. Still, uh, hey. That's right. She's growing too, man. So the diapers be moving up. <laughs> Thank you, YouTube. Hey, congrats to them. Uh, sad news with uh, Tavondre Swept getting picked up on a DWI. Uh, but also, congrats to Ricky Stewart running back out of Tyler Chapel Hill, announcing for the Longhorns yesterday. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow morning uh, with the uh, coffee and football live stream. Jerry Hamilton was there over the weekend with CJ Vogel, uh, as well as uh, Blake Monroe. CJ, it looks like you have one comment before we get going here. What do you got? I do. I wanted to show this comment real here. Aiden Anden going to be the biggest sleeper, very underrated. Texas gave him the VIP treatment this weekend. He was he didn't take a step outside of Moncrief. He was on the golf cart going everywhere. He saw the campus, uh, met with academics as well. Uh, I think Texas is going to make a move for Aiden Anding. And again, you watch the tape there. That's a really impressive athlete out of Louisiana. Uh, made the drive up six and a half hours. I want to make that last quote uh, because we haven't necessarily talked a lot about him so far. He actually had a great quote this morning uh, about Texas in the practice. Go check that out on OnTexasFootball.com. Rod, you'll, you're, you're going to need to watch him because he is new to, to playing football a little bit. Yeah, primarily a basketball player. Okay. And uh, he's, he's a guy that uh, Texas has identified. He, they're not the only one. Miami, I think, came in and offered him as well. So uh, they've got a little work uh, there, but uh, he seems to be uh, a guy that Texas really, really likes. All right, that's going to do it for Sunday night's live stream. Thanks to CJ Vogel, Rod Babers, and to all of you for joining us. Uh, as always, we say hook them to Longhorn Nation. Thanks also to our producer, Matt Hutchison, behind the scenes. He's putting the video up. Uh, and uh, the other stuff, we appreciate him as well. All right, everybody, have a good week. Enjoy the eclipse tomorrow. Don't, <laughs> don't be looking up at it, CJ. You're the young one that they have to tell this to. Uh, don't be looking at it blind. Use the glasses, whatever you got to do. All right, y'all have a good one, guys. Have a good week. Hook them. Hook them. Hook em.